Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Son of All Grace podcast, where every single week we work with you, our church family, to dive deeper into the message. I'm here today with the full ensemble, Dave Holmes and Dusty Stirk. Guys, how was the week? Give me your weekly recap. What happened? How was life? What big highlights? I had a lot going on leading up to the winter or the men's retreat. I was about to call it winter retreat. You want to, I don't know how yeah, much to get into yeah, my no, stories. Should, oh my goodness. You should share at least the bat story. <laughs> the, <laughs> the bat the, in the toilet. The Thursday, the Thursday was probably one of my most frustrating days in a long time. So Wednesday, I found out that our water heater was leaking. So I ordered a new water heater. Thursday, uh, checked it downstairs that morning, made sure, yep, still a leak and we still need to get it fixed. While I was doing that, one of my sons yelled, there's something in the toilet, there's something in the toilet. I went upstairs, and sure enough... House full of boys, that could have been anything. Yes, I was thinking spider, maybe someone just didn't flush the toilet. Sure. You know, uh, sure enough, there was a bat in my toilet, just above the water line, in the lip area, uh, in the front. And then my, I'm like, how do I get a bat out of a toilet? I mean, that's... That's not an easy, you know, that's, they don't teach you that in seminary. At least I missed that, that class and, uh, got it out. We got it out. Some tongs, net, towels. It works. Helmet? Uh, I had gloves. I had okay. gloves. I didn't know what this bat was. I, at any point, I was just expecting to just fly out of this toilet and at my face. Ooh. So, um, anyways. So I had to deal with that and then had to deal with, uh, some, some cabinet Still kitchen kitchen is still getting remodeled. That kitchen remodel. Oh, the uh, the second attempt of getting our island cabinets in was was did not happen. It was a misfire again. So they came with the wrong color again. Anyways, so Thursday was not a great day, but Friday came and we had the men's retreat and it was spectacular. So loved hanging out with the dudes and uh, I'm not sure if I got a lot of rest because, you know, just kind of helping Never. lead it uh, was not the most restful thing, but really enjoyed. I had my relational tank filled, not my energy, but my relational tank filled. Love that. Love yep. that. How do you transition from um, what could arguably be described as the worst day in recent memory to something where you have to be fully present and, like no, no one else really knew about that stuff. I mean, you did eventually share it at the retreat, but like, how how do you turn it to uh, like, okay, I'm going to be present. I'm going to be here, knowing that. Yeah, I was surprisingly calm through most of that that Thursday. Hmm. Like, um, I was just trying. I'm, I'm, I'm going to roll with it. I'm going to roll with it. There's nothing I can do, and I was grateful because every time I go away on a retreat, something bad happens to my wife or house or something while I'm gone. So I was kind of thankful it all happened the day before instead yeah. of it could have happened the day after. And mm-hmm. I'd be getting phone calls all day long about the water heater and the bat and the cabinets, but it was all the day before. So I was able to hand that over to God and say, God, I'm, I'm going to take care of the water heater before I leave. Other stuff we'll, we'll have to deal with when I get back. So, I love it. Yeah. Dust weekly recap. Yeah. I mean, I also got to be at the men's retreat, which was yeah. just a great time to hanging out with some of the guys from the church and just talking about where God's taken us uh, as a church. And that's always fun. Uh, my week was not quite the same as yours. Mine was blissfully uneventful leading up mm, to it. Great. Story. Which I've never been so thankful to say that after hearing your story. <laughs> so... <laughs> So yeah, nothing exciting, but sometimes having nothing exciting is exciting because that just means it's just a normal, normal week. And I love normal weeks. Yeah. So. Hey, yeah. Uh, and I would say for me, oh gosh, uh, I, I left the retreat a little early to come back, but um, you know, we're in a season of like these, of these like last things that we're going to do with our oldest, you know, so he had a senior prom, he had an award ceremony last week. Um, just all these kind of things that are just so life giving, they're sad and exciting all at the same time. Like it's a both and for me. Like mm-hmm. it's like, man, I'm really. It's crazy to think that this will be over soon, and mm-hmm. it's also like I'm just so proud of who he is. So it's a it's a weird. It's a lot of weird emotional energy in the Meltenberger household, and of course, my wife and I don't handle the emotions the same way. Surprise, shockingly, to no one. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just a lot, a lot of emotion. So yeah. yeah, two more weeks and then he's graduating and then it's going to be even weirder. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Can I give a shout out to my roommate from men's retreat? Oh yeah. Joe Ple- Simpson. The legendary the Joe legendary. Simpson. Might be the fastest hiker I've ever met in my he, life. 
He powered through. Powered man. through it. And he He's, wanted to keep going. He wasn't done. Right. Can I just say he was the best roommate uh, I've ever I've ever had. I mean, he was. Well, that feels hurtful he, to some of your past roommates. Well, I mean, not to say anything about the past roommates, but <laughs> but uh, he was he was amazingly uh, uh, man, just just great roommate, just great roommate. Very uh, quiet in the sense of like not a snorer. Mm. He got up he got up early and left, but made like zero noise. Like he was just like a little, little mouse, and uh, it was great. So really appreciate the sensitivity. And just enjoyed hanging out with them. So that's that puts nice. a high standard on people that are going to room with you in the future. Yeah. <sighs> well, that's true. I don't, know, I don't know what to do about that. But. Listen, if you want me next year, I will do exactly the opposite of all the things you just said. <laughs> do you snore? Awesome. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Oh, we can't room together. We cannot yeah. room together. We'll see about that. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge uh, maybe we should get into the text. Maybe. Maybe we should get we're, into the text. Let's get, get to the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, we're in Luke chapter 8. We're continuing to power through the gospel of Luke. We're looking at verses 22 through 39. Pastor Dave, take it away. Let's do this. Uh, Luke eight twenty two. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up, rebuked the wind and raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water and they obey him. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, "'What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me.' For Jesus had commanded the evil spirits to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained to hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged him repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there along the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into them, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region, the Gerasenes, asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God had done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. I feel like we say this every week. So much text. <laughs> so much text. Um, two great stories. Two great stories. I, I made a joke in the sermon about how when we chop up these things, um, you kind of set the reason on why we chop them up or how we chop them up or what does that look like. And um, I may have implied that the reason that you chopped it up this way is because you knew I was preaching this week. And so you just want to mean it. Hey, 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 hey. Yeah. Um, no, did you have any specific thought process when you put these two together? Well, listen, um, there's a lot of different factors going into how we, how we schedule everything out, but these are the first two of four stories. So next week I'll be hitting the, the other two stories, all dealing with Jesus authority and he has power over the uncontrollable. So he has control over the uncon- uncontrollable. Uh, the first two are this week. Next two are next week. So I, I didn't really want to. I can't put all four stories. No, in a no, sermon. right? Yeah, that'd and be a lot. So the theme of Luke, I wanted to keep tied together, and so that's why I gave you first two, and I'll take the second half. So Dusty, when you think about authority, that the authority that Jesus has in your life, and what does that look like, and what's it mean? How do you discern 
uh, what Jesus's authority looks like. I, I think it's important for all of us to kind of answer this question from a personal level, because I didn't really get to it in this sermon. We look at, obviously, what the text says, but what does giving Jesus authority look like for you? Uh, I think, if I tie it back to the text, um, I think some of it has to do with letting go of fear, mm. right? To give Jesus authority means letting go of things that we might... We might be afraid of, but also we sometimes appreciate the control that we have even over the things that we fear. So like, let me tie it back into, you know, what happened when Jesus sent the, sent the demon into the pigs. It's like people were afraid, not because there was still a man that was demon possessed there, right? He was cured, but then they were more afraid afterwards because their norm had just been broken. Mm. They had gotten so used to the idea that like, hey, it's a fear, but it's a known fear. And I'll take a known fear over an unknown fear possibly not fear anytime because I take comfort in what I know. So for me, giving authority to God means saying, Hey, I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I'm going to try to make myself comfortable with that. Cause I assume there's something better on the other side of it versus the fear that I already know of, but that I'm in control of. That's good. I like that. So that idea about, um, just surrendering almost. Yeah, that's what it is. And being okay with the unknown and just trusting like, yeah, I'm going to have to let go of things that I know might not be good for me, but I take comfort in, right? That's how we, that's how we deal with trauma. That's how we deal with, you know, we, we take comfort in what we know, even if we know it's not good for us, hmm. which is how a lot of us end up in the situations that we get ourselves into. Hmm. Dave, same question to you. How do you go about giving Jesus authority in your life? Yeah, I think it's, it's a both and. So I like what you said, Dusty, about trusting, um, trusting God with the outcomes, but it's also trusting God with the process. Hmm. And oftentimes, we don't want to give over the process. Like, we sometimes, I think we recognize the outcome is up to God. Like, God's in control, and He'll do whatever He wants to do. But trusting God with the process is another, like, whole other level of this process doesn't seem right to me. Why are we going over here? Why are we doing this? Why are you telling me? And um, to trust Him with the process and the outcomes, I think, is the ultimate, like, surrender of authority. Yeah, and I, I think um, I would both of those answers resonate. I would I would also add that if I want to give Jesus more authority, and this is kind of what I alluded to in the sermon, is that I have to bring Jesus closer to me, mm-hmm. right? For the process and for the outcome, for all of it, that that the you know um, intimacy really helps me build empathy with who Jesus is. Like it helps me understand it and feel it and see it, right? And so that's one of the things that I just Man, if I'm struggling to give Jesus authority, then one of the things that I wrestle with is how, how, what am I doing to bring Jesus close? I think that's an important question to wrestle with. Yeah. And can I ask, what are some of those things, just people listening? Like, what are some practices that you have in your life that you get that relational intimacy? I spend the first, um, you know, 30 to 45 minutes of my day just with the Lord and reading scripture, usually on the Bible app, um, but also sitting in silence and kind of, um, usually before I work out or before I do anything else, really, it's kind of the first practice. And so that that's one thing. And then my prayer life is fairly um, regimented in terms of, you know, morning prayer time, which is just me and God, and then evening prayer time, which is me, Karen, and God. And, mm-hmm. uh, and those kind of things really help me bring him in. And then, you know, on the men's retreat, we did this thing, rule of life, but there are some, you know, annual practices that I have in terms of extended solitude or fasting or some of those kind of things that all kind of lean into that. So that would be kind of where I lean. Yeah, that's really good. Mm-hmm. That's good. One of the questions I had about the first part of the text um, is if we're going to kind of chunk up the two stories, when you get out into the boat and they set out, they fall asleep, this obviously this very scary storm comes and then the disciples go to, to Jesus and say, master, master, we're going to drown. And, and Jesus asked them, where is your faith? Right. And then, you know, the, the wind and the seas rebuke, you know, listen to Jesus's rebuke, everything calms down. Now they're really confused about it. Here's the question I had specifically for you guys is like, um, what, what should have their faith looked like in that moment? Because when I'm scared, I want to run to Jesus too. Absolutely. So when Jesus says, where is your faith? What do you think he's really referencing? 
And this is not a fair question. This whole <laughs> podcast episode is full of not fair questions. Not fair questions with zero time <laughs> oh, to. Oh, that's respond. what we should have called the podcast. <laughs> not fair not questions <laughs> with Tony. <laughs> oh. I mean, guys, rec- we recognize the humor in the situation, though. Yeah. Because it's, it's kind of funny. Like, it I is. just imagine in my head, like, all right, the storm's coming. You know, disciples are all over the place and they're starting to freak out. And then they, you know, Jesus just wakes up from a nap. Like, oh, what are you guys doing? Like, have some faith. <laughs> like, it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's hilarious. And that, but that's what we do, right? We, we always have a fear that tends to control us unless we know how to actually trust in Jesus. You might say, okay, trusting in Jesus is running to Jesus. But then Jesus, I think a lot of times tells us back like, hey, like how many times does it say do not fear in scripture mm-hmm. over and over and over again? And, but we're human. So like we live in a world where we see all of our fears play out in a lot of different ways, but it's just that constant call that like, all right, like for better, or for worse, like God is in control. And I'm just going to practice not being as anxious as I could be because like I can get pretty anxious, right? I, you know, like anxiety sure. is a oh, thing yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. and that's, that's a spiritual discipline I have to have in my own life is like, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't think about worst case scenarios, like for lack of a better, less cliched term, you know, let go and let God as if we haven't seen that on, you know, 500 bumper stickers, but it's still true. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a, one fun question. Like, you have to remember what the disciples have already witnessed from Jesus. Mm. He's raised people from the dead, right? And like, he's he's done a number of miracles already. And here they're they're coming to Jesus, thinking they're going to die by by water drowning. Like, it's like you really think that Jesus is gonna send you this far and show you all these things just to die by drowning, like Mm. um, with Jesus in the boat with him. Like, do you you really think that this is what my plan is for you? Like, I have such a bigger plan for you. You don't even realize you lack the faith. You lack the trust that I've called you to something great. um, And you think you're just going to get, get taken out by a storm. Like, come on guys. Like I have, I've called you, like, I don't think they understand the calling on their life right now of what Jesus has in store for them. So, and there's something kind of humanizing about that too, right? Because like you got those guys, just like you said, they were with Jesus and they already saw what Jesus did Yeah, and they still found a way to become afraid in those situations. Sure. Whereas I think we feel bad about ourselves sometimes where it's like, oh, am I really putting enough trust and faith in Jesus? And like sometimes in scripture, it's just this humanizing process where it's like even the people that were with Jesus that had, you know, Jesus physically right there with him Mm -hmm. still were kind of being idiots in that moment, right? They were still doubting every step of the way. So like, like for those that struggle with doubt. You know, like, I think maybe that's a little bit of a blessing in disguise there saying that even the people that were around Jesus at the time still had those moments where they struggle with doubt. There's just something inherently human about that. Yeah. Yeah. Can we just take note that Jesus took a nap? Can we just just pause and say, if you want to be like Jesus, take naps, take naps. One of the commentaries that I was reading in preparation for the sermon was talking about how humanizing it is for Jesus to be sleeping on this. And yeah. Because he had just got done preaching, he was exhausted from yep. ministering, like, yep. and so I, I, I always appreciate that perspective, and um, I, I love the fact that the disciples are following Jesus, and they're just still not really sure who he is. Yeah, there's something beautiful about that. That's yeah. like, who is this? You know, like that even the waves and the wind obey him, like. Like, well, who'd you think you were following? Like, you know right. what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> uh, but I just, I just appreciate, you know, the disciples, they, they oftentimes get a bad rap. Um, but man, I, I see myself in them so much. Yeah. Well, that says something like dramatic about our own spiritual formation where it's like, sometimes all God asks us to do is to show up. And like you said, trust in the process, mm. like the process is it's going to take you some time. But just the act of showing up, the disciples going with Jesus when they were still kind of unsure, but they at least had enough faith and courage to say, okay, we'll follow. Yeah. They might in the back of their mind say, we're going to see how this plays out. Maybe I still don't fully believe, but I, I think, you know, blessed are those who, you know, step forward in faith, even if they don't quite believe in the faith that they're trying to ascribe to. Yeah. And what what does it say? I mean, the fact that... Luke tells us the boat was swamped and they were in great danger. So this was a serious storm. Yeah, this was not like a right. I mean, this wasn't like the the disciples were making this up or like you know going being dramatic. Know. Yeah, no, no. This was this was intense, 
and that can happen like from Mount Hermon, like the the wind and coming off the mountain and, and the cold and the heat coming together. But what does it say about Jesus? Even in his sleep, he is like the Prince of Peace, hmm. right? Like he could sleep through this storm. Such a good point. And that he had such trust, even even when he's sleeping, he's just like. I need to learn to develop those nap skills, man. That's a, that's, that's a ninja style it nap. Sk- I mean, that's amazing, yeah. bro. Well, it, I, I can nap like it's nobody's business. Well, listen, I try. I, I got a toddler, and he stomps around. But, but like when we were out, uh, we were on the ocean a couple weeks ago, and we were doing our vacation thing, and we took a little charter boat out. And one of the things that the captain of the boat said is he was talking to us about wind directions and how quickly storms can encumber you. Yeah. He said, hey, number one, never trust a northeast wind. I mm-hmm. never heard that before. It's like there's something about a northeast wind that is incredibly unpredictable. And we were out there with a northeast wind that day. Oh. And he's like, hey, I want you guys to watch the sky because I'm going to tell you right now, it will look like nothing. And then five minutes later, it will look like we're all going to die. Mm-hmm. And he said, that's when we need to jet back to the shore. Interesting. So like I imagine what they were dealing with was, you know, yeah. was pretty rough and it probably came quick. Sure. And they're some of these are fishermen, they're experts. They've been yeah. up there. They know it. Yep. And they still thought this is gonna be this is gonna be the the end for us. So yeah. Well let's move on to the second story that's got a little bit more <laughs> robustness to it. Uh where Jesus restores a demon possessed man. Uh, l- let's kind of start at, at verse twenty nine. It says for for Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, kept under guard, he had broken his chains and been driven by the demon into solitary places. The the writing isn't super clear in the way that Luke breaks this up. One of the questions I heard after the uh, after the sermon that I thought you might want to speak into uh, was this idea about what what kind of timeline are we looking at with this Jesus and the demon possessed man because it's it's a little. This is not clear language on, on how Luke writes it. Yeah, so the timeline, the question is, how long has this man been demonized? And how long has he been chained? Is that kind of the, kind of the question? Yeah, like, because it's, it's, uh, he steps aside, he's chained, and then all of a sudden, there's this kind of, you know, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell at his feet, so, you know, have he come to torture me? Jesus commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man, Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, he kept under guard. He had broken his chains and had been driven to the demon into a solitary place. So it's interesting, right? Is he is he chained when he first meets Jesus? Is he broken the chains and then come back? What does that look like? What's your what's your take on that? I've always pictured it as so. Here's this man who is demonized. Um, the townspeople um, are trying to deal with them themselves. They, they do attempt to chain him. They do attempt. And Mark also gives this story in Mark chapter 5 and adds a little bit extra detail. Uh, but it says in Mark 5, For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stone. So I'm always picturing the townsfolk got uh, did their best to try to subdue this man could not. Uh, he would break the chains even even um, on a regular basis, and so eventually he ended up in a solitary place in the tombs. And then at that point, Jesus comes and and uh, he's confronted them. So I don't I don't see this as like all a one event or like a one time breaking of chains when Jesus shows up. I, I see this as a constant kind of battle with the townsfolk, not knowing what to do with this. Uh, seemingly crazy, demonized man, and um, finally Jesus is able to control what the townsfolk could could not try to, they, they tried but could not control for a series of maybe days, weeks, months. Yeah, that's good. That's kind of that's kind of where I landed as well. Yeah. Does that say anything to add there? Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I mean, I just assume that the way it describes it, that this, this guy had been a known entity for this community for a good long while, right? Yeah, this, it was, yeah. So it was something they were used to living with and it probably been happening for some time. One of the things I said during the sermon is like, this is this wasn't some like weekend bender that this guy was no, on. No, This was like, he's a known problem. Mm-hmm. He's, he's uh, like, oh How gosh. How terrifying would that be? Uh, well, especially roaming naked. Like there's just a part of that that is just like, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a, I just don't have a box to put that into my head. Yeah. I mean, they could not control this man. Like, this guy had super strength from this demon, like if he could break chains. And who knows what he was going to do next, right? right? And so I can imagine just the fear from the from the people were pretty strong. Do, 
where do you land on demon stuff like this? Well, that's a broad question. Yeah. <laughs> where do I land? Are there demons? Yes. Can they can they uh, wreak havoc in someone's life? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and there. I mean, I've, I've sat in counseling sessions with people that had demonic, you know, like we we've seen a lot of that stuff play out. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just gonna leave that story there. <laughs> you have some Same. good ones, man. That's a whole other podcast. It is a whole I mean, other podcast, yeah. but yeah. It, it's there's a comforting piece to recognizing that with God there is also you know the opposite, right? We also have. Yep. Satan has a very real existence. And, you know, if there are angels, there are also demons yep. and it's not as comfortable to talk about, but at the same time, you know, if you want something that proves, if you're looking for something to prove the existence of God, you know, you can't believe in evil without believing in good vice versa. And that's just a spiritual reality that we have to be ready to deal with. I agree. So verse 30 and 31, um, Jesus asks him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them into the abyss. Now, in my version of the NIV, abyss is capitalized, Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that it's a proper place. And um, so I had someone come up after the sermon and ask, is Jesus asking the man what his name is, and the demon answered, or is he asking the demon what his name is? And... What are your thoughts on the abyss? <laughs> Do you, <laughs> such hard questions. Just for note, it is not capitalized in the ESV, interestingly enough. Really? No. It's That's, but it is in it, yours, it, right? In IV, yeah. yeah. In the NIV yeah. too, yeah. which is the proper Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just take the reading at face value, which I think we should always start with, mm-hmm. it says when Jesus saw um when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. Um, for Jesus had commanded the evil spirits to come out of the man. So Jesus had already seemingly addressed the evil spirits before the question. Jesus asked, What is your name? So there's already seems like a dialogue going on with the evil spirit. Yeah. So my first just you know take is he's he's asking the the demon or demons what what is your name not not the man but but the demons hmm. yeah that, i mean that's where i landed too i actually i actually found and, and kind of alluded to this in the sermon i just love the character of jesus that he calls people and in this case demons by name like he he's i i do think that his his goal is always to set people free Right. And, and including like to set those demons, get them out. Right. Like, and, mm-hmm. and he's just a, a God that calls people by name. And for me that maybe that's too much of a, a, a stretch, but I, I love, I love that Jesus asked what people's name is. It's just, it feels so comforting to me, even uh, in the face of opposition. Mm. I mean, there's, there's a whole theology around the idea of knowing your, knowing somebody's name. There's power in that. And uh, I don't really want to go down that rabbit trail too much, but there is um, when when you when you name somebody, you're, there's a power authority there to name mm. somebody, and there's also um, a power of it's a little bit like Rip Van Wrinkle, like the whole Rip Van Wrink, Wrinkle, Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle. Winkle, Winkle. No, not Rip Van Winkle. That's the guy who slept. What's the guy who who could thread the gold and? Uh, and, and he would never tell oh, his name. Gosh. Oh, gosh. You know what takes, I'm talking about? Yeah, I know exactly who you're talking uh, about. I just Rumble don't know the name. Rumpelstiltskin. Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and so you you could have power over Rumpelstiltskin if you knew his name, right? Yeah, I think right? so. I think that's and so right. I think there's a power <laughs> a dynamic in the name of theology of, of being named, knowing your name, knowing else, mm. other people's names. There's something going on there with that. But I yeah, don't, I don't okay. go down too it's also like a really common just you know for those like I watch some scary movies like yeah like that, that's a common trope too is like hey if you're going to do battle with something being able to call it by its name is the first step in disarming right right so all yeah. to say you know hey, that's obviously yep. fictionalized but there is something to it there's something to that for sure any thoughts on the abyss well I don't know if we have time to go to Revelation with the abyss and and the whole word you know I I there's a place for uh, demons. And I think the abyss is one of those, could be referred to as one of those places where, where they'll get sent. Yeah. Any insight? No. 
<laughs> not on that topic. That's I, a, I do think it's that's a spiritual a very place too. Yeah. yeah, I do think it's yeah. a spiritual place too. Like I, it's, it's a place that, um, it's very, in, I think it's intentionally named here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't spend the I time didn't prep looking for up this, Revelation uh, the either. Abyss, yeah. <laughs> uh, but my, if my memory Unfair questions right. with Tony. Yeah. Full. Okay. Let's get to the one that I teased in the sermon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so why did Jesus send him into pigs and why did those pigs die? Right. So like Jesus said, Hey, don't the demon said, Hey, don't torture us. Send us into the pigs, not the abyss. Jesus says, okay, you can go to the pigs. He sends them into the pigs. The pigs then run off the cliff, and the pigs drowned. They cried, wee, wee, wee. All the way. <laughs> oh. They did not go to the I'm market. Waiting for they my, did uh, not go. Waiting for my drum roll. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, actually, oh, yeah, that's probably a better one. More yeah. appropriate. More. That was for the pigs. That yeah. was for the pigs. Yeah. Mm. How fast is this, this? How fascinating is this whole story? I love this story. This has gotten me to to think a lot about demon possession and what demons can possess and why they why they choose to possess. And yeah, I had read something that said that the reason they chose pigs because they were unclean, right? And so, like, there's a natural uncleanliness to demons. <laughs> you know, like it was kind of like sure. demons are bad. Being unclean is bad. Ergo, right. they can go together. Um, you, you know, you had mentioned something earlier. It's worth repeating again about the economy. Well, you want to mention that? Oh, well, I, was, well, I was thinking like, you know, when the effect of this story is that there were a lot of people that got mad at Jesus, right? After this had happened. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, why, why were they upset? And I think there's a couple ways you could approach that one because, you know, go back to the thing. They were more comfortable with the known fear versus the unknown solution. And it was just what they were used to, even though they knew how to control it, even though it was awful. Uh, they had gotten used to this guy living amongst them, but it had to have been devastating for the economy as well in that small town, right? right. Because Absolutely. you're talking, you know, like that's, that's not a small number of livestock <laughs> that, you know, yes, this guy was saved. And this is what I want to connect it to, right? I want to connect it to, you know, Jesus going out of his way to save the one despite the other 99. It's the, it's the prodigal son thing again, yeah. where it's like, Hey, if, to Jesus, it was worth it for this one guy's soul. Even if it meant, you know, eliminating this entire, <laughs> you know, multi acreage of livestock in the process, <laughs> yeah. but it was worth it to Jesus. It might not have been worth it to the townspeople, which worth may be one Jesus. of the reasons they were angry with them, but it was definitely worth it to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is fascinating to me that they asked to go into the pigs um, and that pigs, pigs can be possessed. Yeah. That's weird to me, but we're going to go with it because that's what scripture says. So like what can, what can and cannot be possessed? Like, and why do they get destroyed? But I think I think the bottom line is when you look at the point is demons demons don't bring life; they bring destruction, mm. right? And as soon as they enter the pigs, the pigs go right down and just they die and they drown and like they they self destruct basically. Yeah, and you think about the power; like all of that was in that one guy, right? Right. <laughs> so yeah. you talk about the power to break chains and stuff. Okay, it was it was enough power to kill two thousand living other things all inside this one guy. Yeah. Right. Like that's wild. What's for me is so fascinating, right? Is when you look at the, the, you put these two stories together, the disciples weren't sure about who Jesus was, but the demons were, Yeah, the demons were. And, um, and then the restored man, the man who had the demons in him, he ends up being made fully whole, mm -hmm. right? Like a, Luke is very clear about, Hey, not only he's in his right mind and he's dressed. Yep. And so, and he's sitting at Jesus's feet. And so there's this kind of idea, like the, the disciples, Jesus' chosen ones, mm -hmm. unclear. The mm -hmm. demons who uh, knew exactly who he was and wanted no part of it. Clear, but no obedience. Clear, but no obedience, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And yep. then that third area is like unclear, but uh, fully made whole and restored massive amounts of obedience, wants nothing more than to be close to him. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. There's unclear, but obedient disciples, clear, but disobedient demons and clear and obedient man who just got healed and restored. Yeah. 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 It's pretty cool. I, it's the, the arc of it was super fun Yeah, that I had never until, until we put this together like this had never really spent the time to try to be like, okay, what's the common denominators and all of this. And I think that is one of the, the, the really beautiful parts of a, doing kind of a survey course of a text like this where we're... Aren't you glad I gave you two I'm stories? I'm so glad. <laughs> In my I'm infinite so wisdom, glad. as you said. <laughs> infinite wisdom. <laughs> I gave you these two for a reason. Uh, 
They need to go together. They, they really need, need to go together. Yeah. Well, and really yeah. all four of them do. Well, yeah, yeah. but we can't. But yeah. yeah. I mean, but when you think about, as you're listening to this podcast, make sure you, you subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and listen to the sermons back to back so that you can get all four stories together. Yeah. Because both Mark and Luke definitely will yeah. bring that out. Yep. Uh, closing thoughts on the scripture or the idea of Jesus is authority dust. Oh, I, so on authority, one thing I noticed in that scripture right off the bat is there is no argument from the demons to Jesus, right? <laughs> right. There, there was like, I'm saying there was <laughs> no battle. Such a great point. There was no battle that took place. Like they recognized the authority that Jesus had. It's not like, all right, we're going to fight it out right here. It's like, no, as soon as Jesus encountered this man, they basically said, please don't torture us. Have mercy. I was like, they were acknowledging that Jesus was Lord above them, right? Mm, right off the good. bat, there was no fight there. Mm-hmm. It was just, hey, please don't, don't make it too rough for us. So, like for us, there's 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 a comfort in that that no matter what your fear actually is, that you serve a God who has ultimate authority, and there should be no fear there. Closing yeah. thoughts on the text. I love the fact that Jesus doesn't invite him to come with him, but he sends him back home. Mm-hmm. And um, we're going to get into this, but that's the idea of there's there's the coming and there's the going. And Jesus invites us to come and follow, but he sends us out pretty quickly afterwards. And this man, this man would be the first evangelist to the Gentiles, if you think about it, like oh, wow. um, to this region. And and uh, and we'll see later. Uh, he, he has some good uh, progress in his evangelism. People respond. So yep, that's so good. And, and I would say for me, I just think that we can't ever, um, we can't ever underscore the importance of letting Jesus have authority in our lives. Yeah. Like, you know, there, I think that there are a lot of days where many of us feel like the, the world is in utter chaos, whether that's the storm or the, the oppression of evil, or, you know, if you just watch the news, it feels demonic right there. And so that idea about just, um, getting dressed, getting in your right mind and sitting at the feet of Jesus, just a a powerful way, um, to live into the faith. Trust the process, trust trust the outcome. Mm, It's good. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, we should try to do this podcast one time before we preach the message. That's that's (laughs) really good stuff in here. (laughs) A whole lot easier. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Let's get to uh, our next segment of the podcast, the PRs. Uh, Who wants to go first? I'll go. Yeah. So this is not a book. This is not anything other than a recommendation to get involved with the community. All right, so we spent the whole weekend, uh, we spent, you know, the weekend with the men in the church kind of having community there. We did some group confession work, which was just, you know, is always healing, yeah. right, to get that stuff out in the open. And then uh, we were able to host a life group when we got back on Sunday night. And same thing, like we found so much joy within the community of believers and just understanding that, man, like you are not meant to live your faith alone. And I would say you really can't live your faith alone and become the kind of person that Jesus ultimately wants you to be. So just huge recommendation that either find a person in your life to uh, help disciple you or to work with you better yet, find a group of people in your life Mm -hmm. as well, just to be able to lean into the community so you can pursue Jesus with others and they can help you in your spiritual formation. I've been really loving uh, a new podcast uh, that is kind of centered around the same idea about being spiritually formed specifically through your wounding it's not like the most uplifting podcast ever. It's called being known hmm. by a guy by the name of Kurt Thompson. And I recently had him on my podcast and was kind of doing some research. And I was like, man, this, this deep dive into your wounding and to uh, that emotional pain and grief and trauma. And if, uh, you know, if you're wrestling with some of that and you're feeling like you're not sure what to do with it, that's a, that's a really great tool being known podcast with Kurt Thompson. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to piggyback off of Dusty's. I was just going to recommend uh, to the men, the men's retreat next year. Yeah. Like every every year, I'm just blown away by like, man, this is this would be so good if every guy yeah. came. And it is good. I think it would be even better if we had more guys there. Um, it, we get real. We get honest. And um, it's it's we walk away going, why aren't we doing this more? Like every yeah. year, like we say, why aren't we doing this more? And then, of course, life hits us again, the waves mm-hmm. hit us and we get all whatever. But, uh, so the guys listening out there and the ladies, the ladies just had their women's retreat too. And I heard that was fantastic yeah. also. So when we, when we advertise these things, um, we don't, we're not advertising junk. Yeah. We're not, we're not, we're not 
ever pointing you guys to things that are a waste of your time. We wouldn't do it if it was a waste of time because we sure. value our time. Yep. And uh, <laughs> so when we advertise something like this, we this is good stuff, and we think it's good for for all of us. So I love it. Well, guys, that's our podcast for today. As always, we're so thankful for you, for our church community. The biggest compliment you can give us, share this episode with a friend. Maybe somebody who you know uh, is struggling with the authority of Jesus in their life or has questions about demons and pigs. Yeah. 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 Uh, And don't forget to hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts. As always, we look forward to bringing you a new episode every single Wednesday, 2 p.m., Thank you so much and have a great week.